Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. With fall about a month away, many alfalfa producers are thinking about another cutting before the weather changes. SUNUP's Curtis Hare talks with our extension alfalfa specialist, Kelly Seuss, to learn more today. Talking alfalfa now with our extension alfalfa specialist, Kelly Seuss. And Kelly, um, for most of this crop throughout the state is pretty much cut, but there's still an opportunity for another cutting for a lot of producers out there. Yes, uh, at this time of the year, uh, guys are kind of winding down their season. Uh, depending on their situation, their moisture situation, they're looking at probably one more cutting before it's time to uh, let the crop grow again for and gain some nutrient reserves for the winter time. There's, uh, there's still that, uh, this presence of uh, insects out there right now that we're looking at that can cause some problems if they're looking for hay, some forage. Uh, one of the ones we look at uh, that I've seen here recently, uh, grasshoppers are still an issue. Uh, blister beetles are still an issue, especially as folks with, uh, that are dealing to horse folks and, and working with horse, horse industry people. One that, that we're most concerned with right now is the fall armyworm. We're seeing a, uh, this is a time of year, late July through August, when it's really hot time of the season. We see a lot of uh, potential and we're starting to see an upswing in uh, fall armyworm in a lot of crops. And another pest we look at is uh, spotted alfalfa aphids. The, uh, they come along this time of year, they really, they, they really thrive in this hot 90 plus degree temperature conditions. And so uh, the plant has a really toxic reaction to uh, the feeding of this uh, insect. And so it can cause chlorosis, and if the numbers get high enough, uh, uh, death of the plant. What are some things that producers can look at if they need, you know, if they are going to have an issue? Uh, basically, right now, now that we know they're there, you know, there's there's some other there's some trapping issues that we uh, things that you can do, uh, pheromones. Uh, if, if you want to see when the first flight begins. But basically right now we're just out there looking, at, you know, because we know this is a time frame with, that they're more prevalent. Be out there scouting. Uh, our thresholds right now and uh, established stands are about uh, two to three per square foot. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, for the spotted aphids, they're about uh, 10 per stem. And so if you're looking out there doing some scouting in the fields, uh, the most important thing right now is just be out there looking and seeing what's that because we know this time of year we're prone to have that kind of activity. You know we're, we've had kind of a strange summer it's been really hot been really cool been wet been dry mm -hmm. um, are there things that producers need to think about if they're if they are going to try to get one more cut in that crop that they need to you know just just actually like management of the crop? Well just as far as management I mean uh, it, all of it just depends on the, uh, mother nature I, I mean if you've got the moisture you know, uh, and, you, and your growth is good enough, it's, it's a management decision where you think you've got enough uh, uh, growth potential and yield potential to even make a crop. Uh, that's, that's, you know, and, and so then th this late in the season, you're thinking about, you know, uh, the timeline of giving yourself about six to eight weeks after a cutting to let the crop kind of come back and grow a little bit, get those nutrient reserves. So we're in that timeline right now of in, within the next probably three to four weeks of making that decision where uh, is it even feasible for me to make another cutting or not? Alfalfa is a really resilient, resilient plant. And so if it, if it turns off really, really hot uh, from now, the next uh, few weeks, it's gonna kind of maintain itself. It's got enough root reserves that it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna maybe, you know, potentially even go dormant for a while. Uh, that usually happens earlier in the summer, but uh, it's a really resilient plant. And so I've seen instances where we thought they were totally, totally, totally gone, a, a whole stand, and uh, in the middle of summer with a drought situation and they come back. So, uh, and, and then if, if we happen to have some early freezes, some really, really early freezes, uh, again, d d depending on what kind of variety and what kind, kind of cultivar you have, it's gonna go dormant at, at a given time. And so it's pretty, it's, like I said, it's a pretty resilient plant, so it's gonna to adapt to the conditions we have here in Oklahoma pretty, 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 pretty well. Alrighty, thanks Kelly. Kelly Seuss, Extension Alfalfa Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Welcome to the Mesonet Weather Report, I'm Wes Lee. It's not uncommon for Oklahoma temperatures to seesaw back and forth from week to week. This past week, we were on the cool side of the seesaw. Average daily temperatures shown by the blue line were several degrees below the long-term average indicated by the dark feel. 
Wheat planting is just around the corner. The average wheat variety tends to germinate best with a soil temperature between 54 and 77 degrees. At Mesonet, we utilize probes at 2, 4, 10, and 24 inch depths and under both bare and sod covered soil to determine soil temperatures. That brings up the question, which one should I follow to determine when to plant? Bare soil tends to fluctuate dramatically with sunshine. You can see this by the brown line indicating 4 inch temperatures at El Reno. The 2 inch depth also tends to change fairly rapidly with weather changes. Therefore, we typically advise to look at a 4 inch depth and look at the 3 day average map like shown here from Wednesday to make decisions. Using bare or sod may depend on your farming practices, clean till or no till. While we might be close to wheat planting temperatures now, next week's return to hot, dry weather will definitely heat soils back up for a while. Gary's up next with a focus on rainfall. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well, it might seem strange, but even though we've had quite a bit of rain over parts of the state over the last week, we still had some worsening conditions on the drought monitor report. Let's take a look at the latest map and see where we're at. Well, the real worsting comes up in the Oklahoma Panhandle, in the western Panhandle, uh, parts of western Texas, and in much of Cimarron County, we did see those D0 conditions, or the abnormally dry conditions. So not drought yet, but they did start to pop up in that region of the state. We had a little bit of improvement down in the southeast Oklahoma, a little bit of improvement up in northwest Oklahoma, but the rains just happened to barely miss parts of those regions. Uh, so we'll have to see what we get uh, coming up next week. Hopefully we can start to pound some of that drought out in these new locations. The worsening conditions do show up just a little bit on the latest uh, topsoil moisture report from the USDA. We see another 3% of the state added to the percent short to very short for the topsoil moisture. So at 39%, again, not too bad for this time of year, certainly better than some of our neighbors. Um, but we do need some rain to keep those numbers from going up too much further. Now speaking of the rainfall that went into that new U.S. drought monitor map, we do see some really good totals down across uh, southwest Oklahoma, west central Oklahoma, and in a broad region of southeast Oklahoma. Just happens that uh, the, the part of the state down there where the, the drought conditions are moderate, uh, the, the heavier rains just, just happen to miss that region. So uh, when we start to look down in that area, we do need some of those uh, darker uh, greens and the yellows and reds start to show up. Hopes for rain continue to increase as we get into the last week of uh, August. We do see greatly increased odds of above normal precipitation across Oklahoma for that period, especially across the northwestern part of the state. So hopefully some of those rains can hit some of those drought areas up in that region. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Dr. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. Kim, last week you said the August WASD was bullish for wheat and pretty much neutral for corn and beans. What's the situation? Well, that wheat shot out of the chute like a scalded dog, you know. It, uh, wheat prices in Medford, Oklahoma got up to around $7.20. They moved over 30 cents in one day. However, they got up there, they stayed there for a day or two, and then they've dropped back down to around $6.90. So you saw wheat do as projected corn and beans also you got a little price increase in corn beans stayed about the to the same position they were in why the volatility do you think well if you look at what's going on in wheat they've been lower in production around the world you go back to june we started having problems with the u.s hard red spring wheat crop our protein and for the hard red winter wheats is a little low this year so we need that hard red spring wheat to blend with it uh, it start, we started losing it because of hot, dry weather all the way up into Canada. Uh, right now, they've been talking about 30% less wheat than, say, we had last year or so. Uh, then over in the Black Sea area, Ukraine, uh, they're harvesting a record crop, but Russia's wheat production from June projections to the current projections have went from over 3.1 billion bushels down to below 2.7 billion bushels. So a big decline in Russian wheat uh, there. You've got other problems like in the European Union, too much rain. They say that less than 40% of that soft red winter wheat is gonna be milling quality. So we've lost a lot of wheat over the last couple of weeks. 
What do you think the market is offering for harvest delivered corn and beans? Well, if you look at uh, corn, it's pretty, been pretty level around $5.50 for a forward contract for corn. Uh, Milo around five eighty five. dollars Soybeans, $12.90. Those contracts are just wandering around waiting for to get into the harvest because we're not really going to know the size of that crop until we get it on the scales and in the bin. How do those forward contract prices then compare to historical prices? Well, if you look at historical prices, they're significantly higher. Right now, your wheat, uh, you know, $5.20 is the historical historical average. You look at corn, you're down in the, the 375 to four dollar range. Beans running around nine dollars and fifty cents to nine seventy five. So we've got relatively good prices now. And your guidance for producers if they, they want to sell in any of those categories? Well the market's relatively volatile. Now wheat's been showing it but it can happen in corn and beans real fast. I would take advantage of some of these higher prices but I wouldn't sell it one and done. I'd stagger it in the market. I n normally say a, a three sales but I would probably move that out to maybe four or five, si uh, four or five different sales. Stagger it in the market because you don't know when that price is going to go up or when it's going to go down. Interesting times. Kim, thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. Good morning, Oklahoma. Welcome to Cow Calf Corner. This week's topic, we're going to discuss fence line weaning of beef calves. What do we mean by fence line weaning? Basically, it's a process where we wean calves where we're just putting the cows across the fence line from the calves themselves. We always say when we wean, we know we're going to create stress on cows and calves. It's the calves in particular that we're trying to eliminate as much of this stress as possible. And there's two primary things when we go through the weaning process that we're weaning calves off of. One is the companionship and the social interaction with their dam, and the other is milk that comes from their dam or what has been their primary source of nutrition up to that point in life. So traditionally in the beef cattle business when we thought about weaning we're going to catch the cows and calves, we're going to load up those calves, we're going to take them somewhere else off site maybe, put them in a dry lot or a different pasture and totally separate them from their mothers. Now what we've seen in several studies over the years is that we can reduce that stress on calves if we actually use fence line weaning, a process we typically say lasts four to ten days, where we take the calves when possible and just leave them in the same pasture, and we take their mothers and just put them across the fence line. What does this accomplish for us? It permits the nose-to-nose -nose contact or that companionship or social interaction between calf and its dam that eliminates that part of stress while those calves are acclimating to a new diet. So uh, at this point we typically when we wean calves we've got a functional rumen so they're ready to start eating grass, hay, or potentially some sort of creep feed. We find that in most cases when we want a fence line wean a five strand barbed wire fence is satisfactory to create that barrier that we need and still permit that nose-to-nose -nose contact. Depending on how our wire is spaced or the condition of our fence, sometimes we, we may need to go in and run a single strand of hot wire on one or maybe both sides of that fence to prevent nursing through the fence itself. But the whole process, if we can accomplish it in about four to ten days, we see less stress on the calves. We see calves that actually spend less time walking perimeter fences. They tend to spend more time resting, eating, and drinking. If uh, we can leave them in that same pasture that they've been raised in, they're already going to be familiar with where feed, water, and grazing areas are. So that helps to eliminate a little bit of stress on them as well. If we need to, we find that putting water troughs or feed bunks or hay feeders right in that fence line where they're going to kind of interact and mingle with their mothers so that as they walk back and forth on that fence line they're inevitably going to find sources of nutrition is going to help them and the calves that we fence line wean tend to gain more weight the first couple weeks post weaning 
They tend to maintain that advantage in weight gain all the way through as we look at them several weeks out. So this time of year, uh, or any time of year, regardless of when we calve and take a look at weaning, if fence line weaning is an option to you, it's something to consider relative to eliminating stress and potentially having healthier calves that are gaining weight quicker post weaning. Thanks for joining us this week on SUNUP. Fall's right around the corner, which means hunting season's right around the corner. But Dwayne, there's some things that hunters need to think about going into this hunting season with aflatoxins. Right, so aflatoxin is produced by a, a fun fungus called Aspergillus, and it grows on lots of different grains. When, when we have environmental stress, uh, like droughty late in, late in the summer, some of this uh, Aspergillus will produce aflatoxin, which is toxic to not only wildlife, but also livestock. What, what exactly does aflatoxin do to the wildlife? So it causes a whole series of both chronic and acute toxicity problems, uh, everything from uh, lowered reproduction ability, uh, so in other words, turkeys might uh, lay fewer eggs, or it can cause immune problems. Animals can be more susceptible to disease. It can also be acute issues such as liver failure. Now, do any of those issues actually impact from the, like for, you know, if people are going to want to be processing this game to eat, is that, is there any uh, problems that could occur for, on that end? Uh, p potentially, if, if the levels were high enough, I mean, this is why the FDA has very stringent requirements for grain that is being fed to livestock to make sure that, you know, those aflatoxin levels are not, are not carried through the food chain. So that is a potential risk. Uh, the biggest risk for wildlife is just, uh, you know, health issues to them. And unfortunately, a lot of uh, grain that folks are buying for wildlife uh, either hasn't been tested or doesn't have as stringent requirements uh, that's required for livestock feed. So that's something to really think about, buying old moldy grain or cheap grain that, that is not up to those rigorous testing standards, you're putting wildlife at risk. If you do need to feed, uh, make sure uh, that you're buying grain that has been tested and, and, and if, you know, if you ask a reputable uh, uh, meal, they should be able to tell you that, what level the aflatoxins were. So, so, so think about that. And also you can think about buying al alternative feeds where aflatoxin risk isn't there. Like if you're, if you're trying to supplement white-tailed deer, you can feed protein pellets instead of a, a, a grain that has carbohydrates in it. And there's also the way that the grain can be distributed that can maybe decrease aflatoxins out in, uh, in the environment as well, right? Absolutely. So piling grain uh, where it holds a lot of moisture is a bad practice. Uh, aflatoxin, uh, even if the grain starts off free of aflatoxin, the, the aspergillus, the, the fungus, it's in the air, it's all around us. So it can get in the grain once it's in the environment. So you wanna spread that grain out. And you also wanna minimize how much is on the ground at any one time. You shouldn't be putting a, a lot out at once. It should be a uh, amount that can be eaten by wildlife within three or four days. Now, and you actually have a fact sheet that people can go to if they're concerned about this. Yeah, and it talks about spreading the grain, how long it's on the ground, buying aflatoxin-free grain to start with, and also uh, different grains have different risk levels. Corn is much riskier than grain sorghum or milo is. Uh, so, you know, that's an alternative uh, grain that could be used. All right, thanks, Dwayne. Dwayne Elmore, Extension Wildlife Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And if you'd like a link to the fact sheet he mentioned, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. In early August, uh, Dr. Rod Hall sent out a memo to veterinarians to alert them that anthrax had been diagnosed in Texas. Uh, it's not unusual for Texas to have anthrax cases, but this particular case was found in Quanah, Texas, in Hardeman County, and they typically do not see anthrax there. Now, Hardeman County is just across the river from Harmon County and Jackson County in Oklahoma. People should be aware of this. Cattle producers uh, need to pay close attention to their herds. Typically, uh, 
if a cattle producer has pretty healthy cattle and all of a sudden finds a dead cow in their herd, that's the type of situation we'd most likely find if it was an anthrax case. Um, they would probably need to alert their veterinarian and maybe have them look at that cow. Uh, some clues that might indicate that this was an anthrax case is we typically see these cases, uh, we don't see rigor mortis in these dead animals. Uh, they typically bloat rather rapidly and they decompose quickly. So those are all clues. And one of the m main clues that we look for is we see blood uh, oozing from sites like the mouth, nostrils or anus. If you see that, that would be a clue that you might have an anthrax case. Now typically uh, we see anthrax most of the time in places where we get flooding uh, or you get drought. This disturbs the soil which brings these spores up to the, uh, to the surface and that allows these cattle or other animals to ingest them or possibly breathe them in uh, and get infected with this organism. We need to keep in mind that if you have an animal that you suspect with anthrax, you need to be especially careful. It is a zoonotic organism. Uh, people can be infected with it. The other thing you want to be careful about is uh, you don't want to open up that carcass because if you open it up, the bacteria will sporulate and then those spores will be uh, will last for several years uh, in the soil. So the carcass needs to be disposed of carefully. It either needs to be burned or it needs to be buried properly. If you'd like some more information about anthrax, if you'll go to sunup.okstate.edu. Ponds are important for Oklahoma agriculture in two big ways, your pocketbook and your lifestyle. Thinking about ponds and agriculture, the first thing that's going to come to most people's minds would be livestock watering. The animals require a source of abundant, high quality water, and we tend to take our ponds for granted. I encourage livestock producers to keep an eye on those ponds, not only for the level of water, but for the appearance of the water, the color of it. If it's uh, getting too much in the way of nutrient enrichment from the manure or other sources, uh, you might need to do a livestock watering test. And the higher those levels are, the greater the chance of having a problem with an algal bloom, and nobody wants to deal with that. Irrigation is another use of ponds that's not nearly as widespread, but very important for those who do irrigate. If you're going to irrigate, I uh, encourage people to think about having their intakes from low down in the pond. At the bottom water on the pond is going to be highest in nutrients and uh, you're going to be doing a favor for uh, the fish also by getting rid of some of that nutrient rich water off the bottom of the pond. Ponds are an important part of the rural lifestyle. All of those uh, memories that you have or need to have of going fishing with the kids and the grandkids, that happens at the pond of course. Given all that ponds do for us, why shouldn't we spend a little more time so that uh, you can do some regular maintenance uh, on the pond to avoid problems? Walk the faces of your dam and your spillway and your shorelines to look for any signs of erosion. The quality of fish that you're catching, are they getting a little on the small side? Are they getting a little on the skinny side? If so, now's the time to take some steps rather than waiting until you have a stunted fish population that really can't be solved. For a link on fact sheets relating to pond management, just go to the SUNUP website. Finally today, we talk with Associate Dean Dr. Cindy Clary about what's new in the Ferguson College of Agriculture as OSU's fall semester gets underway. Well, the first week of classes and the fall semester in particular is always the best. Students are brand new, they're coming to college for the first time, or they're coming back and they haven't seen their friends all summer. Students, faculty, and staff are really longing to be together and to see one another and to have some things return back to some sort of normal. A Little bit different, but some sort of normal. So it's a really exciting time. The Ferguson College of Agriculture has a really broad set of majors, thinking from fundamental biochemistry 
to the things you normally would think about, animal science, agribusiness, entomology, ag education. We have a brand new major. You might have seen a little bit of information on it. It's agricultural systems technology. That major, undergraduate major, was just approved a few months ago, and we already have five students in it this fall, so I'm very excited about that. I think the key thing for any student in any major is being open to the different possibilities. And then as they come into those programs, they take classes from all kinds of areas. And through that process, then they open themselves up to different types of career opportunities for them. And we have students in master's level degrees and also in PhDs. We have very strong programs and strong enrollment in animal science, natural resource ecology and management, so very, very broad based at that level as well. Our focus in the Ferguson College of Agriculture is of course to serve the students in the state of Oklahoma and I'm so excited to see those numbers grow, go up this year. But to see that growth in the students of Oklahoma coming into the college is very exciting. But I'm also very excited that they have a chance to connect with, make friends, and learn from students who come from all over the country as well. So those numbers are up as well. Um, on both sides, both resident and non-resident students. But they connect together, they learn from one another, they learn about different areas of agriculture and different career opportunities. It's just a wonderful environment to be a part of. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone, and remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.